the three Barstow children of Wethersfield, Connecticut, Mary on the left, Daniel on the center, and David on the right, shared with their parents, Robbins and Meg Barstow, a great enthusiasm for the kind of family fun generated in the 1950s by Walt Disney's early television programs, which they loved to watch together in the living room. When they saw outside the Main Street drugstore in Old Wethersfield a contest announcement of 25 free family trips to Disneyland, sponsored by Scotch brand cellophane tape, they realized that here was a way they could make an impossible dream come true. So they bought not just one, but six rolls of Scotch tape and the whole family set to work. David made a three-dimensional model of Disneyland Castle using Scotch tape. Mary created a Scotch word puzzle. Young Daniel copied his own words right on the official entry form. And Meg was inspired to write a poem about Scotch tape. I used alphabet soup letters to spell out an acronym. Finally, we carefully wrapped each of these attention-getting entries, plus a photo of all five of us using Scotch tape, in a large carton and mailed it by special delivery to the contest sponsors in St. Paul, Minnesota. We knew we had to make our entries really stand out if we were going to have any chance of winning in this nationwide contest reportedly entered by over one million people. Then came the long wait and a return to ordinary activities like mowing the lawn with the help of other neighborhood residents and mowing the boy's hair in the front yard to help keep family expenses down. It really didn't hurt. At that time we had a little pet parakeet named Binky and we all kept trying to teach it to say where's the scotch tape? Where's the scotch tape? Then one day in June Binky seemed to see sense something special in the air and sure enough a telegram was being delivered to our house. This looked important, so the whole family gathered outside the front door for me to open the envelope. It was from the president of the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, and it read, Congratulations on being one of the winners in the Scotch Brand Disneyland Contest. Unbelievably, our dream was really going to come true. Meg was the next member of the family to read the telegram. It said that a company representative would get in touch with us the next week to make arrangements. Then it was 11-year-old Mary's turn to be overcome. What a way to start a summer vacation. When eight-year-old David got to look at it, he also was grounded. The telegram actually was addressed to four-year-old Danny, the youngest, who wasn't really able to read it, but who nevertheless went head over heels at the news. Talk about being blacked out and seeing stars. It was as if there were a whole sky full of fireworks exploding on the 4th of July. It didn't take us long to recover, however. We were one of 25 families across the United States who had won this fabulous prize for a free week-long trip to California, and we wanted to be the first family to get there. So the kids lined up with their Mickey Mouse Club hat, shirts with their names on them, and airline travel bags. Actually, we had to wait till the 3M's representative personally delivered to Danny our airplane tickets and $300 in cash for meals and incidentals. Danny's winning entry was the simplest of all. I like Scotch brand cellophane tape because when some things tear, then I can just use it. The date set for our departure was Wednesday, July 11th. Both the Hartford Current and the Hartford Times carried photo stories about us, which our friends and neighbors excitedly shared with us. The headlines read, Danny for Labor's Long Wins Vacation for Family, and Ten Words Written by Four-Year-Old Wins Family Trip to Disneyland. 
Meg had previously made for each member of the family a brightly colored Davy Crockett jacket, which we used on camping trips. We thought it would be great to wear these jackets for our trip, and the whole neighborhood came out to wish us bon voyage. They threw confetti and streamers at us as we got into the car to drive to the airport. We weren't just married, but we were just contestied. Back in 1956, there were lots of families with kids, like the Nidles here, living in Stillwell Drive. The Dibbles lived next door on Coleman Road. Neil and June Cox lived in Wethersfield then, and their older daughter Anna was Mary's best friend. Dudley and Ruth Birmingham, with their sons Dick and Alan, lived across our backyard. Mrs. Johnson and her friend represented the older generation in the neighborhood, and the family of Dorothy and Joe Bonin lived right next door to us. What a great send-off they all gave us as we headed up to Bradley Field as it was 40 years ago. We were going to fly first from Hartford to New York and then to California. We brought along our scotch tape made sign and the pilot and stewardess were greatly interested in our being Disneyland contest winners. The children each wore white sailor hats that had Connecticut written on them so people would know where we were from. This was the first time they had flown in an airplane, so it was very exciting for them. In those days they didn't have jet planes, just propeller driven airships. But just being in an airplane like this was a tremendous experience for all of us. The pilot flew right over Wethersfield, so we could look out the window and try to pick out our own house someplace in the middle down there. When we got to New York, the plane landed at the old Idlewild International Airport, which later became the J.F. Kennedy Airport. We had to change planes here, and I must tell you that the Scotch Date Contest Prize was actually only for a family of four, and here we were a family of five without any extra funds. But since we certainly couldn't leave anyone behind, we worked out a deal. The company had furnished us with four first-class tickets, and we simply exchanged them for five tourist tickets at no extra cost. It meant we wouldn't get fancy meals served to us in the luxury rear section of the plane, but we were happy just to eat our picnic box lunches in the more crowded forward part of this giant TWA Super Constellation plane, which had a capacity of 64 passengers. Here we are out on the runway, ready to depart for the long nine-hour flight from New York to California. Uh, this was a difficult shot to take of the plane taking off, but I used a telephoto lens. As the plane flew over New York City, we could look out the window and see down on the right the United Nations building, and then over on the left the Empire State Building. What a thrill it was to be four miles up in the sky, flying high above the clouds. We followed our route on a map of the United States so we could tell when we flew over the Mississippi River down there below on our way to a midpoint stop at the striking new St. Louis, Missouri airport. Here they changed crews and the plane was refueled. As we flew on across the country, above the Great Plains and then the Rocky and Sierra Mountains, we counted a total of 14 states we had flown over by the time we landed in California. We had traveled over 3,000 miles in a single day. This was the first time that any of us had set foot in California. So this was a big moment. We were met at the airport by a limousine which drove us to the fabulous Huntington Sheraton Hotel in Pasadena where we were booked to spend the next seven nights. We had never stayed in a luxury hotel like this before so we didn't quite know what to expect. It turned out that we were the very first of the Disneyland contest families to arrive when we disembarked from the car in our Davy Crockett jackets. The hotel manager himself was there to welcome us. 
with a great big basket of fresh California fruit. The Huntington Sheraton Hotel has a tremendous expanse of rooms, lawns, trees, and gardens. Its vine-covered architecture is a reminder of bygone days of more leisurely and gentle upper-class style and elegance. The feature we liked most about it was the large outdoor swimming pool, which was open for guest use without additional charge. We took advantage of the pool the first morning we were there to help us recuperate from our long plane journey. I went in first to break the ice, so to speak. Come on in, everybody. The water's fine. David was the next enter with a good standing jump. He was followed by Mary doing a graceful dive. And down at the shallow end of the pool, young Daniel was about to take the plunge. Mary offered to give Danny a piggyback ride around that end of the pool where David was practicing his dog paddle. Careful now, Danny. No ducking. That's a good boy. You know, everything about this trip was magic. When we got tired of swimming in the pool, all we had to do was think about it, and we'd rise right up out of the water and back onto the diving board. Again, David was next to follow suit, being careful not to bump his head on the way up. Mary made it look not only easy, but graceful as well. Later that first day, we rented ca a car so that we could orient ourselves to some of the other sites and attractions in the Los Angeles area, where none of us had ever been, before going on to spend the bulk of our week's time at our primary objective. Disneyland. We could tell it was California because of all the different kinds of palm trees we saw. The landscape was very different from back home in Connecticut. On our way, we stopped for a picnic lunch on the ground underneath a large palm tree. This was one of the ways we managed to survive on our very limited meal allowance. As we drove past a bunch of orange groves, it looked as if orange juice was being made right before our eyes. Knott's Berry Farm was an old-time mining camp amusement park which predated Disneyland and still had some interesting attractions which made it worth visiting also. Reminiscent of the gold rush days, they had set up an elaborate sluiceway structure where you could actually sift through sand and water and pan for gold. Each of the children took a try at this, and, with a little help, each one of them managed to sift out a small amount of gold dust, which, siphoned into a small bottle, they were able to keep and take home with them as an enriching souvenir. Part of the park was a so-called ghost town, inhabited mostly by trained animals. There was this goose which kept trying to find a way to get into the bar, there was also a good-natured donkey, which wanted to get educated by attending the local school. The school marm was a cow, and when the proper time came, the cow would grab the rope in her mouth and ring the school bell. The next day, they had arranged for us to take a gray line tour of Hollywood in a special sightseeing bus. The children again wore their white Connecticut sailor hats, we were glad we weren't driving when we traversed the notorious Los Angeles freeway, but it was fun to pass by the famous midtown intersection of Hollywood and Vine, and to look for movie stars walking along these streets. One place we did stop at and get out was Grauman's Chinese Theater. This is the place where actors and actresses make handprints in cement blocks on the sidewalk. We saw the outlines of the guns of early Western star Bill Hart and of the famous profile of John Barrymore. We found a likely spot for two new ladies' handprints, 
but it turned out that the cement there already held the imprints of Jane Russell and Marilyn Monroe. Then the bus drove us through the exclusive Beverly Hills area, where the homes of a number of glamorous movie stars were pointed out to us. The next house coming up here is the house that Gary Cooper lived opposite. I was on the wrong side of the bus to get a picture of Cooper's actual house. Walt Disney's Hollywood production studios were, of course, a must. And then we visited the massive movie-making facilities of Universal International Studios. This was way back in 1956, but at that time here on this one gigantic lot in the foothills outside the city, films could be made having any place in the world for a setting. As we drove past southern mansions, secluded country houses, town halls, a local grammar school, a foreign hotel, we felt like we were touring around the world in 80 minutes. These were ready-made backdrops for particularized movie scenes, the outdoor settings for all kinds of film action. But in reality, most of them are just false fronts, one-sided sets made of wood and plaster and propped up to give the impression of a desired locale, but with just bare construction boards behind the film facade. For an African scene, trees were mounted on a wooden platform so they could easily be moved around. This medieval castle was really just a shell for exterior shots. Unhappily, we saw only one movie actually being filmed on the day we were there. It was a commercial for a new car. But we were all greatly impressed with this behind-the-scenes look at the world of movie-making 40 years ago, and connected to it, we also were impressed visiting the home of the late, great American humorist Will Rogers, not far away. The grounds and gardens were spectacularly beautiful. Will Rogers, you may remember, was noted for saying, I never met a man I didn't like. Our itinerary included just one more excursion before the big days to follow at Disneyland itself. Passing the fabled Pacific Ocean beach of Santa Monica, we headed for the steamship docks to take an afternoon trip on a large ferry boat out to Catalina Island across the deep blue ocean water off the California coast. Here we enjoyed a brief cruise on a glass-bottomed boat where we could look down through the floor and see the colorful fish and exotic undersea gardens pointed out to us by divers right beneath the boat. It was while we were on this popular resort island that we had our first and only chance to go swimming in the Pacific Ocean. This invigorated us for the following day when we finally arrived at the entranceway to Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom, the climax of our family dream journey. This is Disneyland as it was just one year after its official opening. We paused to have our pictures taken in front of the flowered face of Mickey Mouse outside the railroad station and then we walked through the tunneled gateway to a world apart. The first thing we decided to do was to ride the Skyway to give ourselves a bird's eye overview of the whole park. Sitting in a metal cable car moving along from tower to tower, we could see the rocket to the moon spaceship in Tomorrowland, the kid cars driving around Autopia, and the Disneyland train that encircled the park. And the excitement kept mounting as the cable cars continued high in the air and passed over Fantasyland, where we looked down upon everything from the storybook whale to the tented carousel to the red and white sails of the pirate ship from Peter Pan. There were the Mad Hatter teacups, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, and Sleeping Beauty's towering castle, to say nothing of Frontierland and Adventureland. Having enjoyed this Skyride preview, now let's go back to the entranceway and follow our dream through this Magic Kingdom step by step. To get into the park itself, you go through a short tunnel underneath the Disneyland and Santa Fe Railroad, and then the spell takes place. Children's faces looking up, holding wonder like a cup. This is the town square at the head of Main Street, USA, where all kinds of shops and friendly characters are found. Like this well-dressed sheriff keeping everyone on good behavior. 
Even the street cleaners are in uniform, and they keep the place spotless. Our first stop was at the Disneyland City Hall to check in with our credentials as Scotch Tape Contest winners and to pick up four days' worth of free tickets for all the rides. When we emerged, all of us in our special Davy Crockett jackets, what did we find greeting us but the famous Disneyland Marching Brass Band, all in bright red uniforms. What a welcome! Then Mary noticed the Disneyland news on the corner stand, and sure enough, today's headline read, The Barstow Family Visits Disneyland. That was enough to make anyone jump with excitement. We decided then that the children needed to have official Disneyland hats to replace their Connecticut sailor hats, at least for now. Dan and Dave bought space helmets, and Mary got a wide brim plastic shade hat. Our first ride was on the horse-drawn trolley car down Main Street, USA, reconstructed as it might have been half a century earlier. This was remember when time for grown-ups, and why aren't things like this today? Time for the kids. On the right we saw the Main Street Cinema, starring Rudolph Valentino and Vilma Banke in Valentino's last film, The Son of the Sheik. Across the street were the Carnation Ice Cream Parlor, the Bake Shop, the Penny Arcade, and the Candy Palace, with all kinds of goodies in every window and storefront. At the end of Main Street, there's a circular park from which branch out the four different major theme lands. This is where we said goodbye to the straw-hatted horse that had pulled our trolley. Over on the right, we found, first of all, Tomorrowland, with a special clock telling what time it was all around the globe. We took a thrilling simulated ride in the rocket ship to the moon and back. And remember, this was 13 years before humans actually did set foot on the moon. Also in Tomorrowland were miniature spaceships revolving at various heights. And then the drive-it-yourself Autopia. Now to pilot one of these little cars around the course, you had to be as tall as the bottom of this sign. David made it just by a hair, but poor Daniel wasn't high enough, so he had to find another activity while David went for a drive. This was grown-up fun for an eight-year-old. The next land we visited was Fantasyland, the entrance to which is through the many-turreted Sleeping Beauty Castle across a bridge over a protective moat. This fantastic kingdom has settings and rides from any number of different times and places and stories. Most of the attractions relate to a familiar Walt Disney movie or cartoon character. Danny's favorite was Dumbo, the flying elephant. He and his mother got into the seat behind the broad wing-like ears of the little elephant, and soon they were off and flying. The world goes round and round when you're up in the sky with an elephant. Here's how it looked to Danny and Meg as they sailed through the air on Dumbo's big ears. Hold tight now. Another way to go round and round is in one of the Mad Hatter's teacups from Alice in Wonderland. By turning the wheel, you make the cup whirl. And all you can see is a dizzying blur. When you finally do stop spinning around, you'll find yourself face to face with Monstro the Whale, right out of Disney's Pinocchio. A canal boat takes you for a gentle ride through storybook land, going right into Monstro's giant mouth. Despite these fearsome teeth, however, the whale doesn't really swallow you, and when the boat comes out on the other end, you pass by beautifully constructed miniature settings for favorite childhood stories. Here we see the houses of straw and sticks and bricks built by the three little pigs. This is Raddy's place from Wind in the Willows, and up behind is Toad Hall. This house in the forest belongs to the seven dwarfs. You can see all their names on the signpost. 
these cobblestone streets tell us that this is Pinocchio's picturesque little village in Italy. And finally, looking up in the distance, we see Cinderella's shining castle. This brings us to the Casey Jr. Circus Train, with specially constructed cars to carry different kinds of passengers. The engine pulls the cars up and down over a series of nicely landscaped hills and valleys until they arrive at their destination. And then from one car, they unload the wild animals, and from another, the monkeys. Well, after all this excitement, we felt the need to go to the bathroom. At first, we didn't know where to go, but then we saw the signs for Prince and Princess, and we remembered that everybody in Fantasyland is a prince or a princess. Then it was time for lunch. Knowing that everything here is magic, Meg had brought all of our meals wrapped up in this little plastic case. So we all sat down on the bench and waited patiently while she took the lunch bag out of the case and carefully unfolded it. Careful now, don't anybody push. And sure enough, out of the bag, each of us took a nicely cooked cheeseburger and a carton of milk. So we ate our full and restored our energy for the next part of our Disneyland adventure. The third special land we visited was Frontierland, which is entered through a stockade gate. Here the boys naturally had to exchange their Disneyland hard hats for the Davy Crockett's coonskin caps, which had been brought all the way from Connecticut just for this occasion. The first stop by David and Danny was the Frontier Trading Post. Danny bought a pair of toy pistols too big for his holsters, and Dave bought a lariat to go with his fringe-worn jacket. How would you like to go for a western stagecoach ride? Okay, if we can sit up on top behind the driver and see how he manages not just two but four horses pulling us along. Past an Indian teepee village, a water hole with a family of moose, then across the painted desert with its giant cactus plants, and underneath a great stone arch. Further on, we pass a covered wagon on its way to Oregon, and end up next to a pack mule train headed for the mines. We didn't want to miss that either, so we each mounted a donkey and took a ride up to a hillside where we could look out and see the Mississippi River steamboat the Mark Twain coming around the bend. This was a large stern paddle wheel boat which circled Tom Sawyer's island where we also spent some time before finally moving on to the fourth and final special land, Adventure Land. Imagine all of this in one great park. Notice the elephant tusks marking the entranceway to Adventure Land here the boys traded back their coonskin caps for the more protective Disneyland helmets. And now we were going to experience our most exciting travel adventure, riding in a jungle river cruise ship down some of the world's most famous and dangerous waterways. We were cautioned to keep our arms inside the boat. But some of us still got wet from the spray as we went underneath a waterfall on the Congo River in Africa. Up ahead in the brush we could see a lion, and then the head of a giraffe loomed over the treetops. We passed a family of threatening rhinos, partly hidden by the underbrush over on the right, and then on the left we heard the loud trumpeting of an African bull elephant, raising his long white tusks and flapping his great ears. Then in the water, right beside the boat, we saw the heads of some large hippopotamuses wriggling their ears in warning. As we were watching one pair opening their mouths, our guide suddenly yelled, Look out! There's a big hippo right up ahead! And he pulled out his gun and fired a shot right at him. And then he fired again. And another one at a crocodile over on the riverbank. Wow, what a close encounter that was. The guide said that this is the skull of an earlier passenger who didn't make it. Dan had his pistol out too, and we were all happy to get back safely. 
Before the week was over, our prize-winning family had spent parts of four days at Disneyland's Magic Kingdom, including one final ride down Main Street on the horse-drawn fire engine. We were almost totally exhausted by the end of our stay, but for our particular family at that particular time, we agreed with Walt Disney that this was the happiest place on earth. As we waved goodbye, we considered ourselves to be one of the most fortunate families in the world to have had this marvelous Disneyland dream actually come true. We made sure that young Danny was able to get in his last licks, and then we departed, forever grateful to Scotch brand cellophane tape for making all this possible for us. Don't ever say it isn't magic because we know it is.